Question one, how much heat is required to warm 400 grams of ethanol from 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius? If the question is asking for how much heat, they want you to calculate Q. One formula we have for Q is Q equals M times C times delta T, where M is the mass of stuff that you're warming. For us, that's 400 grams. C is the specific heat capacity, which you'll probably be given unless they're asking you to calculate it. For ethanol, it is 2.4 joules per gram degree Celsius. 2.4 joules per gram degree Celsius, and delta T is the increase in temperature. Delta T is always going to be your final temperature minus your initial temperature. Here you can do it in your head. You may want to use a calculator if your numbers are more complicated on the test. So here I'm on the calculator, I'm going to do 400 times 2.4 times 15. That gives me 14,400 grams cancels with grams, degrees Celsius cancels with degrees Celsius, which I forgot to write there for you, and this answer is in joules. If you want to convert that to kilojoules, you divide by a thousand, and it's 14.4 kilojoules. This decimal point means that there are three sig figs here. There are three significant figures here, three significant figures here, and the C value we used actually had four significant figures, so we want this to have three significant figures as well. I won't say significant figures too often throughout this video, but you will probably be responsible for using them properly. What mass of water can be heated from 0 to 25 with 90,000 joules of energy? This is similar. If Q equals MC delta T, then you can calculate M by dividing both sides by C and delta T. I'm just rearranging the formula to get this. My Q, the amount of heat, was 90,000 joules. That's a comma, not a decimal point. C, for water, is something that you're going to want to memorize. It's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Some teachers use 4.18. Some teachers use 4.2. Use whatever your teacher wants. And delta T here is final minus initial, that's 25 minus zero, and that's in degrees Celsius as well. So, on the calculator, 90,000 divided by 4.184, also divided by 25. That is 860.4, 160.4. Now, uh, we wanted mass. Joules cancels with joules, degrees Celsius with degrees Celsius. This is in grams, and because we only have three significant figures in this point, in this number here, we need 860, oh, 860 decimal grams as our final answer. Cool, it's just Q equals MC delta T. We've got a couple more of those for you. 77,500 joules of energy added to 1.43 kilograms of iron, which was originally at 25, what will the temperature, what temperature will it rise to? So, we want to calculate the increase in temperature. We can do that by taking Q and dividing it by M and C. Let's do it. 7,500 joules divided by mass. Now we want the mass in grams because specific heat capacity, at least in the chart that I have here, is in joules per gram degree Celsius. So, 1.43 kilograms, multiply that by 1,000 to get grams. That's 1,430 grams. And the specific heat capacity of iron, I didn't even look it up while it was here, Fe, 0.452. 0.452, that's in joules per gram degree Celsius. Let's do the calculator. 7,500 divided by, I'm gonna do this another way for you. I'm gonna put the denominator in brackets and do 1,430 times 0.452 in brackets there. You might have noticed on the last one, I did the numerator divided by this number, then also divided by this number. That's like me distributing the divided sign through the bracket, but what matters here is that 
these two get multiplied together and then you do the division, I end up with 11.6, that's 11.6, and that's in degrees Celsius, and that is my delta T. That means that the temperature went up, because it's positive, 11.6 degrees from 25 degrees Celsius, which means my final temperature is 11.6 plus 25. That's 36.6 degrees Celsius, a warmer temperature because we added heat. Yeah? Yeah. Question four here is asking us to calculate delta T twice again as well. Delta T is Q over MC. We'll do these quickly. It's 1,000 joules divided by 500 grams times the heat capacity, the specific heat capacity of aluminum, which is 0 0.891, I'll get lazy with units here. I know my delta T is going to be in degrees Celsius. That's 1,000 divided by 500 divided by 0.891. That gives me 2.24 degrees Celsius, whereas lead would heat up by 1,000 divided by the same 500 times the heat capacity of lead, which apparently is 0 0.13, 0 0.13. And doing that on the calculator gives me 1,000 divided by 500 divided by 0 0.13, 15.4 degrees Celsius. The reason I include this question in the practice booklet is to point out that if you add the same amount of heat to the same mass of two things, the one with the lower heat capacity has the higher change in temperature. Because a specific heat capacity is kinda, you can think about it as its resistance to absorbing heat or even its resistance to giving away heat. It takes way more heat to change the temperature of liquid water than it does to change the same mass of steam. And it takes even less energy to heat up the same mass of iron and then even less than that to heat up the same mass of lead. The specific heat capacity is its resistance to absorbing heat and so the lower resistance gives you a bigger temperature change. Cool? Cool. Lastly, question five, we have how much heat is released to the surroundings when a cloud, which is 100 kilograms of water, cools. Cooling implies that the temperature is going to go down. I'm going to I'm going to explicitly do my final minus initial temperature here. My final temperature is 28 and my initial temperature is 34, which means my temperature changes negative 6 degrees. That's because the temperature went down. Pretty easy. Q equals mc delta T. My mass is 100 kilograms, so that's 100,000 grams. We're going to, I'm going to assume that the cloud is liquid water, especially at 34 degrees Celsius. It's very unlikely to be steam. It's probably liquid because water boils at 100. So we're going to use 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius for our C. And our delta T is negative 6 because we already calculated it. Let's do it. 100,000 times 4.184 times negative 6 gives me negative 2510400 joules. This negative sign means that heat was released instead of being absorbed like they were in the first four questions. If I want to convert this to kilojoules, I divide by a thousand, I end up with negative 2,510 kilojoules, and I can actually divide this by a thousand again if you're into playing with different units. That gives you mega joules. Joules to mega joules is dividing by a million or by a thousand twice. Now, I should probably worry about sig figs here. Three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant figures. So I should probably just call this 2.51 megajoules of heat released. Cool. Not too bad. Here we are. The first five questions that I've done with you are Q equals MC delta T because you need MC delta T to calculate enthalpy changes. How do you calculate the delta H for dissolving potassium chlorate, some solid, in water. 
the temperature is going to go from 25 to 24. So, first of all, I'm going to point out that my personal formula for delta H is negative Q over N. The reason I do that is because delta H is actually uh, the Q of the system divided by moles, or rather the amount of heat that's either released or absorbed by the system, divided by the number of moles, and then the sign needs to match exothermic versus endothermic. If heat is absorbed, it was endothermic, and so delta H needs to be uh, positive. Ah, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out later. Let me show you that we're gonna do a Q equals MC delta T after we get a delta T for ourselves, final minus initial. Our final temperature is 24.03, and our initial temperature is 25, so my temperature changes negative 0.97 degrees Celsius. That will give me a Q equals MC delta T of. Now, what's heating up? What's actually heating up here is the water. 1.2 grams of potassium chlorate is getting dissolved, but the water is what's heating up. Now, some teachers will ask you to add up the 100 grams of water that you have and the mass of the salt. That would give me a mass of 101.2, but I personally prefer to use the mass of just the water. I assume that the ions aren't going to absorb heat. Do what your teacher wants. I'm going to use a mass of 100 grams because I have 100 milliliters of water. My C, because I'm dealing with water, is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And we've calculated our delta T, it was negative 0.7 degrees Celsius. That's a calculator problem. 100 times 4.184 times negative 0.97. That is negative 405.84. 8 joules. I'll do the rounding later. What this negative means is that the water went down in temperature and thus the water had to give up energy in order to dissolve the potassium chlorate. Because we're being asked for the delta H of dissolving potassium chlorate, we have to consider that that required energy. Because the temperature went down, the process, or the system here, required energy. That, to me, is the definition of an endothermic reaction, and I want my delta H to be positive. The way that these delta H questions seem to always work is that the delta H has the opposite sign as Q, and that's why I put the negative here. There's a very specific reason related to the system and the surroundings. I like to just do negative Q over N. It works for me. That's negative, negative 405.848 joules on top and number of moles on bottom. Man, I don't have the number of moles. I'm gonna have to calculate the number of moles with mass over molar mass, stoichiometry. The mass of salt that I have is 1.2 grams, and the molar mass of KClO3 is, well, here's potassium, plus, wait, yeah, that's potassium, plus chlorine, plus three oxygens. I'm getting these numbers from the periodic table, of course. The molar mass of KClO3 is 122.55 grams per mole. And when I divide 1.2, the mass, by the molar mass, I end up with 0 0.0979 moles. That number goes in for N over here. And then I can actually do the calculator work for that. The negative, negative cancels out, and I have 405.848 divided by 0.079, or 0 0.0979. And I end up with, here's my old marker, 4145.5 joules per mole. Now I'm going to divide that by 1,000, 4.145 kilojoules per mole. And because we're now doing a delta H, I like to explicitly write my sign in here. 
it was an endothermic reaction because the temperature went down. So I want the sign to be positive, which it is, thank goodness. And so my delta H is positive, 4.15 kilojoules per mole. If you're wondering why I rounded this, it's because, oh, I only have two sig figs. Ah, 4.1, I'm rounding this off to this digit because that's a four, I just chop it off. And I have positive 4.1 kilojoules per mole. I almost tricked myself with my own sig figs there. Delta H's, when you're given a temperature change, are an MC delta T. You take that Q and plug it into this formula, delta H equals negative Q over N. That's how it goes. Let's do another one. Here we've got 25 milliliters of 0.1 molar NaOH and 20 milliliters of 0.8 molar HCl. Uh, what is the, uh, it causes the temperature of the mixture, which was initially at 25, to increase to 29.92 degrees Celsius. What is the enthalpy of neutralization? Okay, now, let me be clear. We're going to do a Q equals MC delta T, where M is the mass of stuff that is heating up. Now, what's heating up here? Because we are mixing two liquids, the mass is actually the total mass of the solution. 25 milliliters of water will weigh 25 grams. 20 milliliters of water will weigh 20 grams. I'm going to ignore the weight of the HCl and the NaOH. That means that the total mass of water that's heating up is 45 grams. My C for water again is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And my delta T is how much the temperature went up by. Final minus initial, which gives me positive 4.92 degrees Celsius. Well, that's just calculator work as well. A lot of this unit probably feels like it is. Times 4.92. I end up with 926.3376 joules of energy being released in the neutralization. The way you calculate delta H in my world is negative Q over N. My Q is 926.3376 joules, and my N is a little more complicated to calculate this time around. Because I am mixing two things, that's NaOH and HCl, and those two are reacting, as any neutralization would, to give me H2O plus NaCl, the N that goes down here needs to be moles of the limiting reactant. So now, I have two things. I'm going to have to calculate the moles to see which one is limiting. For NaOH, the number of moles is concentration times volume. That's 0 0.1 moles per liter times 0 0.025 liters. I took milliliters and divided it by 1,000. That gives me 0.0025 moles. The number of moles of HCl that I have is also concentration times volume. That's 0.8 moles per liter times 0.02 liters, which gives me 0.8 times 0 0.02. You don't need to ah, uh, you don't need to see me do the calculator work, do you? 0.0125. Moles, which is quite a bit bigger than 0 0.0025 moles. This is the lower of the two numbers, so it's the limiting reactant, and it's the number that we port over to plug in for N. Cool, there we are. The reason we have to use the moles of the limiting reactant is because the reagent in excess could be in excess by any amount more than the limiting reactant. This reaction is going to stop when the NaOH runs out. And so the heat that was produced was also limited by how much NaOH we even started with. So let's do the calculator work. That's negative 926.3376 divided by 0 0.0025. I end up with negative 3.70535 joules per mole. 
Uh, four sig figs, four, 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 four. Wow, well that's cool. And I'm gonna divide by a thousand as well. That's negative three, seven, zero, point five kilojoules per mole. I'm pretty sure that the numbers I made up here are not accurate. That is not typical for a neutralization reaction. But uh, here we are, and that's the number I got, and I promise you this math is right. It's probably, I probably wrote an error in the question. Maybe this was supposed to be 0.08. I don't know, whatever. What do we have here? Suppose you have 50 milliliters of 0.2 molar NaOH, okay? And you mix it with 50 mils. That's the same volume of 0.2 molar HCl. That's the same concentration as well. So my moles are the same. Both mixtures start at 25. And the temperature change is measured and then we're gonna calculate delta H. That's what we did in the last question. What happens to Q if we use 100 milliliters of each solution? Well, because Q is MC delta T, the amount of heat is proportional to the mass. Now, delta T is also going to stay, oh, I guess that I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but if you have more stuff reacting, you're going to have more stuff reacting, and thus more heat released. So, Q is going to double if you double the quantity of each solution that you use. If you use 100 milliliters, that's double the amount of NaOH, but still only 50 milliliters of HCl, the amount of heat that's released is still going to be limited by the HCl. So the Q itself is going to stay the same. The delta T, if you use 100 milliliters of solution, is actually going to stay the same as well. And the reason is that you're going to get more heat out Yes, but the mass of water that you're heating up is also increasing. These two numbers are doubling. C is staying the same, and so delta T has to also stay the same. Just because you're uh, mixing these solutions doubly as much doesn't mean it's going to double the temperature change. It just means double the heat is going to be exchanged. Delta T, if we use 150 milliliters of NaOH and still only 50 milliliters of HCl. Here, the Q is going to be the same as if we used 50-50, but the mass itself will have doubled because we now have 200 grams of water that we're heating up. So the same amount of heat as in the original reaction is being released, but it's going to have to heat up double the amount of stuff. Therefore, delta T in this scenario is going to be half of what it was. Hey, wait a second. Does that mean I made a mistake over here? Where's the other question? Oh, no, we doubled the whole, we doubled everything here. And so both the masses and the Q's doubled. Here, because we're limited by the HCl, the Q is the same but the mass is still doubling, and that's why the temperature change is half of what it was. What happens to delta H if you use 100 milliliters of each solution, or 150 milliliters of NaOH and 50 of HCl, or any amount of NaOH and any amount of HCl? The answer is that delta H should stay the same. The reason is that no matter what Q you get out of something like this, and no matter what delta T and M and stuff that you use, the Q will be proportional to the number of moles of stuff that reacted. Thus, the Q over N ratio will always be the same no matter what quantities you pick. And why would we use something like delta H to measure the heat released in a reaction if it wasn't a constant depending on how much you used? It, it wouldn't make any sense. All of a sudden, everyone who uses different amounts is gonna get a different constant for how much heat's released. No, no, no. Joules per mole for a reaction is always a constant, no matter how much you use or how you get that number. Speaking of which, how do you calculate delta H? Well, we've already seen one way. We can use Q equals MC delta T and then divide by moles. That's called calorimetry. 
But there are three other ways that teachers like to do it too. They do call this a mega video for a reason. One of them is called Hess's Law. Hess's Law questions are very easy to identify. You'll be given a list of reactions and then a target reaction that you're supposed to calculate the delta H for. We have to flip these around, double them, have them do whatever we need to do so that when we add these together, it all cancels out to give us this. Can you see these reactions well enough? You should have them in front of you because there's a download that accompanies this. We are looking for the delta H of N2O3 becoming NO and NO2. So, I'm first going to look for N2O3. N2O3 we want on the reactant side. It does not appear in the bottom two reactions here. It only appears in reaction one. So I know that this N2O3 needs to come from reaction one, but it needs to be on the opposite side of the reaction. Most teachers will write reaction one times negative one because you're going to flip the reaction. You get N2O3 becoming N2 plus three halves or 1.5 O2s. The delta H for this flipped reaction is negative 83.7 kilojoules. If you're wondering why these are kilojoules and not kilojoules per mole, it's because it's per one mole of this reaction going forward. It's 83.7 kilojoules for one mole of N2, for 1.5 moles of O2, or for one mole of N2O3. In any case, we need some NO as well. We need NO on the uh, product side. There's no NO here, and in fact, we've already used this reaction. There's no NO in the third reaction, so we know that this NO needs to come from reaction two. But we only need one mole of it, and there are two moles produced here. So we want to take reaction two and multiply it by a half, cut it all in half. That gives us half a mole of N2. See how there was one and I cut it in half? And half a mole of O2 becoming one mole of NO. I could have written a one there, but I chose not to. The delta H also needs to be halved to 90.2 kilojoules. Did I make it explicit enough that when we flipped this reaction, we flipped the sign on delta H? Because if this reaction going forward absorbs heat, the reverse reaction releases the heat and is exothermic. Just throwing it out there. Lastly, we need an NO2 on the product side. We currently don't have any NO2s, but we do have one available in reaction three. So I'm going to keep reaction three as is. That's one half of an N2 plus an O2, making an NO2, and I'm gonna keep the delta H, because I haven't changed the reaction itself, at 33.2 kilojoules. Okay, now, some teachers will be very picky about the state symbols. I personally think that the state symbols don't matter in Hess's Law for a high school student, unless you have two of the same molecule in different states. Lots of teachers will include H2O water, and H2O gas, like liquid and gaseous, you cannot cancel those. You need to be careful that H2O liquids and H2O liquids are canceling with each other. And then the gases are canceling with each other only. Liquid and solid can't cancel. That's the only time state symbols matter. Everything's gas here, so I got lazy and didn't bother. Now, when I add these together, this might remind you a little bit of elimination in math. I have an N2O3, and a full N2 and 1.5 O2s on the left, and I'm producing an N2 and three halves of an O2, and an NO and an NO2 on the right. And at this point, I like canceling things. As long as something appears on the left and the right of the arrows, you can cancel them from either side. Here, I have half an N2 and half an N2. That adds to one full N2, and on the product side, I have an N2 over here. So these cancel with this. On the reactant side, I have 0.5 plus one, that's 1.5 O2s. And on the product side, I also have 1.5 O2s. So these cancel as well. 
what am I left with? Well, the answer is N2O3 becoming NO and NO2, which was my target reaction. Great. Because we get this target reaction from adding these three reactions together, we can get the delta H for the target reaction by adding these three delta H's together. It's pretty straightforward once you manipulate the reactions to cancel out perfectly to give you what you want. I will tilt this so you can watch me type. I have negative 83.7 plus 90.2 plus 33.2. That gives me positive 39.7. So my delta H for the target reaction here is positive 39.7 kilojoules. And we're done. Pretty straightforward. Let's practice that again. If you're practicing with me, you may want to pause the video and then try this on your own. Why wouldn't you? Let's take a look at what we can do here. We've got reaction one, two, three, and four, and we've got a target reaction given up top. I want two SO2s on the left. This has SO2 in it. There's no SO2, no SO2, and no SO2. So these SO2s have to come from here. I need to flip the reaction because I want them on the left, not the right, and I need to double it. So I want reaction one times negative two. The negative for the flipping and the two for the doubling. That's gonna give me two SO2s and four HCLs becoming uh, two SOCl2s and two H2Os. H2O H2O liquid, H2O liquid, okay, good. All the state symbols for all the chemicals match each other. I don't have to worry about state symbols. And my delta H for this is negative two times 10.3. That's negative 20.6. That's in kilojoules, but they're all in kilojoules. I want two P on the left side. No P's here, no P's here. There is a P here and there's no P here. So I just want to take this and double it to two. That's reaction three times two. That'll give me two P's plus double 1.5 is three Cl2s, and double that is two PCl3. I just need to double that delta H. I can double that in my head, that's negative 613.4 kilojoules. I need five Cl2s on the left. There's no Cl2s here. I have Cl2 already, but now I have two Cl2s that I can get from reaction four as well. I want five in total on the left, and I already have three. I've got a feeling that I want these two Cl2s on the left so that the three and two will add to five. It's a bit of a dangerous game when you have the target molecule in two of the reactions because you don't know how much each reaction contributes to it. But here, because I've already used one and I know I needed two times this reaction to get the two Ps, I'm pretty sure that I want these two Cl2s on the other side. Let's work a different way though. Let's say I want two SOCl2s on the right. Oh, I already have them. I want two POCl3s on the right and I don't have those yet. So I want this reaction, reaction two, doubled because it already has POCl3 on the right. I want reaction two times two. That gives me two PCl3s and double a half O2 is a full O2. And doubling my POCl3s gives me exactly what I want on the right side there. My delta H is double this, which is negative 651.4 kilojoules. And now I'd like to point out that I have some O's that need, O2s that need canceling. I have some PCL3s, which actually already cancel. That's ideal. Two PLC, two PCL3s on the left and two PCL3s on the right already cancel for me. And I have some HCLs here on the left that also need to be canceled. All of these things point to the fact that I have to use a fourth reaction to help cancel some stuff out. Reaction four, I want to flip 
I know I want to flip it because I want these two CL2s on the left to add with these to make five. And in addition, I have four HCLs on the left already, and I don't want HCL in my final reaction. So I need these four HCLs on the product side or the right side to cancel properly. All that points to the fact that I want to flip that reaction. So I'm going to two CL2s and two H2Os becoming four HCLs and an O2. For my delta H, I just flip the sign. It becomes positive 202.6. That's still in kilojoules. And now I'm hoping there's a bunch of canceling to do. Four HCLs on the right cancel with four HCLs on the left. Uh, two H2Os on the left cancel with two H2Os on the right. And an O2 on the left cancels with an O2 on the right. What am I left with here? Well, it seems to me that I'm left with two SO2s here, two Ps here, and in total, I have five Cl2s. Well, that's ideal. Look at that. And on the right-hand side, I have two SOCl2s. Yes. And I have two, oh, <laughs> getting excited, two POCl3s, which is also what I wanted. Lastly, to get the delta H, all I need to do is add up these delta H's. That's negative 20.6 plus negative 613.4 plus negative 651.4 plus 202.6. The answer I get is negative 1082.8 kilojoules. When you're using addition, you keep the lowest number of decimal places that you have instead of sig figs. All of these had one decimal place, so when I add and subtract them together, I keep one decimal place. Even though this has more significant figures than any of these, it's decimal places that matter for adding and subtracting. Just throwing it out there, that's my answer, and I did it with Hess's Law. That Hess's Law was one other way to calculate delta H for a reaction. Calorimetry, Hess's Law, and also delta HF, enthalpies of formation. If you want to find the enthalpy change for a reaction and you are given delta HF values, the way to calculate the delta H for that reaction is super easy. The delta H for the reaction is going to be the sum of all the delta HFs for the products minus the sum of all the delta HFs for the reactants. These sigma symbols mean add them all up together. And the ends here imply that we need to multiply each of the delta HF constants that, by the way, we're going to look up in a table by the number of moles of each that we have. This is going to be super easy and you're going to love it. Products, I have an N2O4. I have to add up all the delta HFs, so I gotta look up the delta HF for N2O4. Da, 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 da. Plus nine, it's just positive nine. The N here, or the number of moles of N2O4 that I'm producing is one. So I have one times positive nine. Now, I have three H2O gases, the delta H F for H2O gas is negative 242. And so three of them give me three times negative 242. That's all for my products. I like putting them in big square brackets to remind myself to do all of this together first. And then I'm gonna subtract all the delta HFs for my reactants. I have two NH3s. NH3 gas is listed here at negative 46. And I have two of them, so that's two times negative 46. And I have O2, and I have seven halves of them, so I need the delta HF of pure O2. Now you'll notice it's not written in the chart that I have here, and it's not really written in any delta HF chart. Because delta HF for pure elements in their standard state 
is always zero by definition. In fact, enthalpy of formation is the amount of energy it takes to make something from its elements at standard state. So how much energy does it take to get O2 out of O2? The answer is zero. Delta HF for pure elements is always zero. Remember that, you'll need it. Then I just have to do the math. I'm gonna do the first bracket first, one times nine plus three times negative 242 gives me negative 717. And I'm gonna subtract whatever I get in my second bracket. That's two times negative 46 plus seven halves times zero. That gives me negative 92. And when I do those maths together, that's negative 717 minus negative 92, I get negative 625. Because all of the delta HFs I was given were in kilojoules per mole, and I multiplied them all by moles, this answer is actually just in kilojoules. This is 625 kilojoules of heat released when I use up two moles of NH3 or 3.5 moles of O2 to make one mole of N2O4 or three moles of H2O. So the kilojoules per mole would be different for all of these because I'd have to divide them by whatever the number of moles of the thing I was being asked about was. It's 625 kilojoules for this reaction as written. There we are. And to be a formation, super easy. You love it, I love it. Everyone loves it. Where's question 12? Question 12 is here. Find delta HF for C8H18, which is not in the chart if they give you this delta H. Well, don't worry, because delta H for their reaction is the sum of all the delta HFs of the products minus the sum of all the delta HFs of the reactants. But here, I'm given delta H for the reaction. That's negative 5430. Now, I'm going to use my, my bracket notation again because it'll be useful. There's my products, there's my reactants. My products are CO2 gas. Where's the chart? Oh, the chart's right here. CO2 gas is negative 394 and I have eight of them. So that's eight times negative 394. And I have nine H2O liquids this time. That's negative 286. That's plus nine times negative 286. And that's it for products. My reactants include C8H18, which I don't have the delta HF for. But there are one of them, so I will go one times X. And that X is going to be what I solve for. Then I have 12.5 or 25 halves of O2 gas. But again, O2 gas is a pure element. So it is zero kilojoules per mole for its delta HF. Now, I wrote this like a loser in terms of using the times sign and then X as my variable, but that's the X variable and everything else here is times. So let's just do it together. Negative 5430 equals, I'm gonna do this whole bracket all as one eight times negative 394 plus nine times negative 286 gives me negative 5726. And then I'm going to be minus X and this is zero. One times X is X plus zero is also X. That's minus X. This is a linear equation. If you can't solve this, I'm surprised you got to this level of chemistry. I'm gonna move the X to the other side. I'm gonna keep the 5726 on this side, and I'm going to move the 5430 to the other side and make it plus, because that's how you do algebra in this case. Uh, I'm gonna use my calculator for that. I already have the negative 5726. I'm gonna add 5430. So I'm estimating the delta HF of octane, or my X, to be negative 296 kilojoules because it's a delta HF. It is per mole. Um, the per mole here actually comes from the fact that there was already a times one. So you can consider this to have been one X and then divide it by one, but you get the same answer. Uh, let's take a look. I've got other, other uh, 
alkanes here. I've got methane, which is exothermic when you form it. I've got ethane, which is exothermic when you form it. So octane may also be exothermic when you form it. These endothermic ones are for the alkenes and alkynes. This is for benzene, which also has what we call double bonds in it. So this number makes sense to me, and I like it, and I'm right. That's question 12 for you. Question 13 is the last bit that I have for you about delta HF. Ah, I lied, it's 14. But what does delta HF actually mean? Delta HF is the heat released when you form one mole of each chemical. The delta HF for COCl2 is delta H for whatever reaction makes one mole of COCl2 from its pure elements at standard state. What pure elements do I have here? Well, I have carbon, which at standard state is a solid, it's graphite. I have oxygen, which is O2 gas. Some teachers make you memorize which gases are diatomic. I use Hofbrinkel, that's H-O-F-B-R-I-N-C-L to show me which elements need the little two under it. O is one of them, and I need pure chlorine, which is also in Hofbrinkel, and it's also a gas phase element. Making COCl2 from its pure elements, carbon, oxygen, and chlorine, is the reaction that delta HF actually represents. 1C, 1C, 1O, I only need 1O here, so I can I convert this to a half, and 2Cl's and 2Cl's. For the equation that represents delta HF, you must have a one here on the product side. That is the requirement, and these will be fractions if they need to be. Let's do it again and find out. Here we have PF5 gas being formed. That's pure phosphorus and pure fluorine. Do you know what phosphorus is in its elemental state? It's P4 solid. Do you know what fluorine is? Yes, you do. It's in Hofbrinkel. It's F2 and it's a gas. I need one P because this is a one by definition. So I only need one P here. I'm gonna put a quarter out here so that we only need one quarter of a mole of P4 to get the one mole of P for the PF5. And I need five Fs, but I, they come in packs of two. So I need five halves of an F2 molecule or five halves 2.5 moles of F2 molecules. Lastly, I'm gonna do nickel iodate for you. That's N-I-I-O-3-3, and I'm including this simply because this three on the outside applies to the iodine and the oxygen. I need nickel, which is a metal and solid, its standard state. I need iodine, which comes in a pack of two, and it's also a solid at room temperature. And I need oxygen, which you've seen so often by now, it's not even a surprise. I have one nickel here. See, one nickel. So I need one nickel here. I got it. I need three I's. So that's three halves of an I2 here. And I need nine O's. They come in packs of two. So that's nine halves of those packs to give me nine oxygens. These are the reactions that represent the delta HFs for each of these elements. The toughest questions I see are Hess's Law questions. Hess's Law should be, how far back did I do it? Questions like this. But instead of giving you a target reaction, they say use these reactions to calculate the delta HF for some other chemical. And you have to come up with the target reaction on your own, knowing that you need one mole of that target molecule from its elements at standard state. And then you make things cancel out properly. Cool? Cool. The last question I have for you here is why is delta HF for liquid water, negative 286, and delta HF for water vapor, negative 242? Those numbers came from this chart, so you can verify that they are correct. Well, the answer is that the chemical reaction that makes them starts out with H2 and some O2. These are the, react uh, the reactants for the water that we're going to make. I'm actually drawing you something like a potential energy diagram. 
And you might have to put some energy in to this to get the reaction going. It's an activation energy. Uh, but when you make the gaseous water or the water vapor, that might be about here, H2O gas. It's an exothermic reaction. The delta H is negative 242. But liquid water is cooler than gaseous water because you cool off steam to get the liquid or you boil the water to get the gas. And so to get from H2O gas to H2O liquid, you have to go down the, in energy even farther. It has to release extra energy and it gives you H2O water. That difference is about 44 kilojoules per mole, and it's also a release of energy. So to get from H2 plus a half O2 to gaseous water, you release 242 kilojoules. To get to liquid water, you need to release those same 242 kilojoules and an extra 44 kilojoules. That's why it's more exothermic to make the liquid water. 286 is the negative 242 to get to the gas and the extra negative 44 to go from gas to liquid. That should remind you of Hess's law. This to that plus this to that. The H2O gas would cancel out in that Hess's law and you would add up the delta H's for those two reactions. Cool? Cool. All right, the fourth way to calculate or estimate delta H on one of these thermo tests is using bond enthalpies. Bond enthalpies will often be found in a chart and it will say things like a CH single bond is worth 413 or an SBR single bond is worth 218 or an NN triple bond is worth 941. These are all in kilojoules per mole of the bond that you broke. Uh, okay, so let's use bond enthalpies to calculate the delta H for this reaction. This is methanol or formaldehyde breaking apart to H2 and carbon monoxide. In order to figure out the bonds that we're going to have to break and form, we need to draw Lewis structures. So carbon bonded to oxygen, single bonded to each hydrogen. If you've done organic chemistry, you already knew what this aldehyde was going to look like. Becoming H2, which is just an HH single bond, and a carbon monoxide, which if you're used to drawing Lewis structures, you know is a CO triple bond. They have to follow the octet rule. I have four plus six equals 10 valence electrons to share. And the only way they can satisfy the octet rule that way is sharing three pairs with one pair on either side. So it seems to me we're gonna to have to break all of the bonds in this molecule in order to create these because the, the CO double becomes a CO triple and the CHs don't even exist anymore. So the bonds broken here are a CO double bond, which according to my chart here is worth 799. 799, and we're gonna have to break two CH single bonds, which were worth 413. So that's two 413s. The sum of the energies of all the bonds that we're breaking is 799 times two, 799 plus two times 413, which gives me 1625. Because I've multiplied by the number of moles of bonds that I'm gonna need, I'm just gonna call that kilojoules. And because the bonds that are broken, we need to put energy in to break those bonds, this is kilojoules required. This is an important distinction. Breaking bonds requires energy, and forming bonds is going to release energy. So I write for myself bonds formed, and then I see that I have an HH bond formed. Where's my chart? I need to find HH single bond. That's worth 436, 436. And I have a CO triple bond, which is worth 1,072. That's 1,072. That, when I add them together, now I can do that in my head, 1,508 kilojoules of energy. And that is released 
The reason I do my bonds broken separately from my bonds formed is that I like to convince myself whether or not more energy was required or whether or not more energy was released. That will tell me what the sign on delta H needs to be. In order to break all these apart, you need to put in 1625 kilojoules. And when you form these, you only get 1508 out. You've put more energy in than you got out. So it's an endothermic reaction. The delta H is the difference between these two. That's 1625 minus 1508. That's 117 kilojoules. And because more energy was required, we know it was endothermic. There is a formula you can use for this, just like there was for delta HFs. The delta H is the sum of all the bond energies of the reactants minus the sum of all the bond energies of the products. And the reason that it's reactants minus products for bond energies is because these amounts are the energy it takes to break these, meaning that these are already written as reactant bonds. That might be a little bit of a stretch for you to even bother caring about, but if you're using bond enthalpies, it's reactants minus products for the shortcut formula. I like breaking these apart into two separate ones. I think if kids do this on a test, they can get part marks, even if they make a mistake somewhere. And it makes it very explicit that you know that bond breaking requires energy and bond formation releases energy. Cool? Cool. We're gonna do it one more time for C2H2 plus F2 becoming C2H2F4. C2H2 is ethine, if you're familiar with organic chemistry. But let's draw the Lewis structure like I didn't know. There's two carbons and two hydrogens. That's two times four plus two times one. That's 10 valence electrons. Two, four, six. Two is just to connect the atoms together. And I need to complete the octet on these carbons, so I need 8, 10. That's it. That's all the bonds I have, and we're done. That is reacting with two F2s. So that's an FF, and I'm actually going to write FF again to show that I need two molecules of it. This C2H2F4 is going to be the alkane version, or the fluorinated alkane version, where we added an F2 to break one of those pi bonds, and we added another F2, breaking the other pi bond. We're down to a single bond here. I'm gonna do this the same way I've done them before. The bonds broken, I'm just gonna write B broken here, are a CC triple bond. Oh, it's right here in front of me. A CC triple is worth 839. And I have two CH single bonds, but they didn't break. They're still in existence over here. You can add them in here as long as you also add them in for bonds formed, but you can also just ignore them because they were not broken or formed. They just stayed as they were. You'll have to be careful with larger molecules that you have the exact same number of CH bonds on one side as the other. But if bo a bond didn't break or change, you don't have to worry about it. My bond broken here is just the CC triple, and I have two FF bonds that I have to worry about, and those definitely broke, and an FF is worth 155. That's hardly anything in the grand scheme of things, but you gotta include it anyways. 839 plus two times 155. I shouldn't have said it was nothing. It's actually pretty significant. That's 1149 kilojoules. And again, I love writing the word required in here because bond breaking requires energy. The bonds formed are a CC single, which has now taken the place of this triple. A CC single bond is worth 348. And I have four CF single bonds, which did not exist before. A CF is worth 485. 485, and when I add all these together, that's 348 plus four times 485, bam. What? Oh, I typed it wrong. 
Uh, oh boy, that's a times, but that's a plus. 22.88, 22.88. Kilojoules of energy released. Oh good, in this case, the delta H is negative because more energy was released than was required. 2288 minus 1149 is a difference of 1139, and I know it needs to be negative because it was exothermic because more energy was released. I should have done this the way that I told you to do it over there with reactants minus products. My reactants, 1149 minus my products, 2288, gives me the negative explicitly on the calculator, negative 1139. I personally don't do that though. I just take the difference and then change the sign to whatever I knew it should have been. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Why are the delta H values from bond enthalpies called estimates, but the values from Hess's law and delta HF or enthalpies of formation are more accurate? In fact, these are called average bond enthalpies because not all bonds of a type are equivalent. The things that are connected to the other carbon or the other hydrogen or whatever do affect the bond slightly. These numbers are averages over many molecules that contain that particular bond, many molecules that contain that particular bond. And by the way, it's in the gas phase only. But like if you have a CH4, you can maybe rip off the first H. I mean, that's actually pretty difficult, but I suppose on average, it should take 413. But then if you rip off another H, that's going to be more difficult because you've already ripped one off and this is going to be more resistant to giving up any more than it already has. I don't think these are even valid reactions for an average bond not to be, but the point is that lots of molecules have a CH bond and this number is the average energy it takes to break a CH bond over a bunch of molecules that actually have it in there. The, uh, the SIO, bond energy is just the average of the energy it takes to break that bond in a bunch of molecules that have a silicon oxygen bond. It's an average over many molecules that contain the bond. Cool? Cool. We need to figure out uh, what mass of water can be melted when you burn a kilogram of ethanol. We're given the amount of energy required to melt a mole of water, and we're given the amount of energy released when you combust, that's what the little C here is for, one mole of ethanol. So we are going to have to figure out how many moles one kilogram is, and then we'll get how much heat is released when we burn it. Uh, number of moles is mass over molar mass and we have 1,000 grams of the ethanol here. I don't know what the molar mass of ethanol is. Ethanol is C2H5OH, so that's two times 12 plus five times one plus 16 plus another one for the H on the OH. Gives me 46.07 grams per mole. And when I do a thousand divided by that number, I end up with 21.7 moles. So we are burning 21.7 moles of ethanol. The amount of heat released when we burn that, if we know that delta H equals negative Q over N, then we can get Q equals negative N times delta H for a particular reaction. The N here is the number of moles, that's 21.7. And the delta H we were given, it's negative 20, 20 kilojoules per mole. The per moles are gonna cancel out and the answer I get is gonna be in kilojoules. This is ideal. That is times negative one for the initial negative times negative 20, 20. That gives me 
4.6 kilojoules. That's quite a lot of energy, but we are burning a full kilogram of this alcohol. Now we need to figure out the mass of water that can be melted with that. We're given the delta H for melting, and look, we've been given the Q that's been released. We have to assume that all the heat released when we burn the ethanol goes to the water. Sure, some of it might be lost to the surroundings, but we have no way of figuring out how much would be lost. So, we need to calculate N, which is going to be negative Q over delta H. I have negative the Q, that's 43848.6 kilojoules, is the amount of heat that was released by the ethanol and thus is going to be absorbed by the water, divided by a required absorption of 6.03 kilojoules per mole of water that we're going to melt. So I take this, I times it by negative 1, and then I divide it by 6.03. This gives me a negative N, but I know that that's not true. I'm going to simply strip off the positive because I'm using this negative in a really cat, sorry, I'm gonna strip off the negative. I'm using it in a very cavalier fashion. I'm not worrying about what the system and the surroundings is. I've clearly made a mistake about wondering whether something's absorbed or released. But I know moles has to be positive, and this was just a division, so the sign I can just pretend was positive. 7,271 moles of water can be melted if it's already at zero degrees Celsius. I can calculate the mass of water by multiplying by that by the molar mass, that many moles times 18.02 grams per mole gives me 131037 grams, which is 131 kilograms. My point in doing this question is that if you're given the delta H for a reaction and the number of moles of reactant, you can calculate the heat that is either released or required to be absorbed in that process. And we did it here, figuring out the heat released by the ethanol and using that same Q as the heat absorbed by this ice, which melted into liquid water. And apparently we can melt 131 kilograms of water if it's already at zero with just one kilogram of ethanol. Yeah? Yeah. That changes of state kind of question is much more interesting when you're doing a heating curve. What I mean is, we are going to heat 200 grams of ice at negative 160, wow, that's cold, into steam at 125 degrees Celsius. When you heat ice into steam, the temperature will not go up directly with heat added. In fact, if you start here at negative 160 degrees Celsius, you can heat that ice up in up to the melting point, which is zero. But then you're going to be adding some heat simply to break some of the intermolecular forces and turn the solid into the liquid. The liquid water will also be at zero, so you've added heat and the temperature has not changed. You can take that water and heat it up to its boiling point, that next change of state. But then you need to add heat to break the intermolecular forces and you'll be left with steam at 100 degrees Celsius. You can heat the steam almost indefinitely, but in this case, we're only going up to 125 degrees Celsius. The total amount of energy required is the amount of energy required in this section, this section, this section, this section, and this section all combined. The ones, the sections where the temperature is actually changing you can use Q equals MC delta T to get the heat. When there is a change of state, melting or boiling or vaporizing, you're better to use Q equals N times delta H. Whether or not you use the negative is not my prerogative. We're going to need the total amount of energy absorbed, so they're all gonna have the same sign in the end anyways. This is going to take a little while, but I'm going to do it pretty quickly for you, and you can do it with me too. So, step one, we are going to heat ice 
from negative 160 up to zero. Q equals MC delta T. The mass of ice is 200 grams. The specific heat capacity of ice is 2.01. The temperature change is going up by 160 degrees Celsius. Multiply those together and get your Q. Section two is a phase change. Q equals N times delta H. I don't know how many moles 200 grams of ice is. N equals mass over molar mass, that's 200 grams of ice, divided by 18.02, that's the molar mass of water. 200 divided by 18.02 is 11.1 moles. So my moles is 11.1, and my delta H for melting, chemists call it delta H of fusion, is 6.03. Oh yeah, we did that on a previous question. Oh, I need to point something out. This specific heat capacity is in joules per gram degree Celsius. So the answer you get here is gonna be in joules. This delta H is in kilojoules. So this answer is going to be in kilojoules. We're going to have to put them all in the same unit before we add them. In any case, you'd multiply those and get that answer. Section three is heating liquid water. That's Q equals MC delta T. It's still 200 grams of water. Mass doesn't change with temperature. We have a different specific heat capacity because it is now liquid water. And the temperature change is from zero to 100, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Multiply all those together and get your joules. Section four, vaporizing liquid water. Q equals N delta H. We still know we have 11.1 .1 moles of the water and the heat required to vaporize is 40.2 kilojoules. Multiply those two numbers, get your kilojoules. Section five, the final section is heating the already vaporized steam. Q equals MC delta T because there is a temperature change. It's still 200 grams of water the specific heat capacity of steam, it says here is 2.01 grams per, or joules per gram degree Celsius. And the temperature change is from 100 up to 125. So it's only 25 degrees Celsius. Multiply all those and you get joules. Hey, look, I did the math for you. All we need to do to calculate the total amount of energy is to add these together. We just have to be careful about the units. I'm going to convert them all to kilojoules. I don't care what you need, you can't convert them to. It can be joules. The total amount of energy needed, I'm gonna write that as Q total equals first amount of energy, 64.32 kilojoules, plus second amount of energy, 66.93. Third amount of energy, divide by a thousand, 83.68. Fourth amount of energy, 446.22. Fifth amount of energy, divide joules by a thousand, 10.05. When you add those together, you get the total amount of energy in kilojoules needed to do all five of these processes. Ice at negative 160, all the way to steam at 125.
that plus 66.93 plus 83.68 plus 446.22 plus 10.05. I end up with 671.2 kilojoules. That's a lot of energy, but we are taking 200 grams of ice and going from super cold to super hot steam. Makes sense to me. Cool. All right, what types of thermal energy are present in solids? Well, the answer to that is only vibrational energy. The atoms in a solid are sitting beside each other and they are in fixed position. And the only thing that those atoms or molecules can do is vibrate next to each other. The intermolecular forces that are holding it together in a solid are preventing it from doing other things like rotating or moving around. When you melt a solid into a liquid, the molecules still have vibrational energy, but you've broken enough of the intermolecular forces that they can rotate and move around each other. That's why liquids can flow and solids cannot, because the molecules can move around each other due to rotational energy that they have in addition to the vibrational energy. Gases have vibrational energy because the atoms and molecules can vibrate no matter what. And they have the rotational energy needed that to melt a solid into a liquid. But when you've turned a liquid into a gas, you've broken all of the intermolecular forces. So sure, the molecules can be rotating, but they are also moving freely around the container. Gases expand to fill their container because they can move up, down, and side to side. That's called translational energy. The reason it takes energy to melt solids into liquids is because you're giving the molecules an extra degree of freedom, rotational energy, and breaking intermolecular forces to give them that freedom. The reason it takes energy to melt or I mean vaporize a liquid into a gas is because you need to break even more of the intermolecular forces and give those gas molecules translational energy so that they can move all around the container that they are in. Let's talk about potential energy diagrams. I want to draw a potential energy diagram for this exothermic reaction. The only thing that I really care about here is the fact that an exothermic reaction releases heat. And so your reactants, which can start up here, C2H2 plus 2H2, need to undergo a chemical change and end up at a lower energy level. This is just C2H6. This is a potential energy curve. We like to label the x-axis reaction progress because here the reaction has not progressed at all, and here it has fully progressed from reactants to products. And the delta H is the difference in energy between the reactants and the products. I've seen teachers dock marks for not drawing these arrows carefully enough. This arrow has to go all the way up to where the reactants are, and this arrow has to go all the way down to where the products are, but that difference in energy is your delta H. In this case, it is 312 kilojoules formed as a product, so it is negative 312 kilojoules right there. If you're into kinetics, you'll, or maybe even just biology, you'll know that this amount here is the activation energy for the reaction, but I didn't ask you about that, so you don't have to put it into this particular diagram. How is an endothermic reaction any different? Well, the only thing is that the reactants are at a lower energy level than the products because you need to put energy in to push the reactants up into the product state. Here we have three O2s, and here we have two O3s. We're still measuring the potential energy. We still have the reaction progress going from left to right, but here we have to put energy in to make the O2 into O3. The delta H here is positive 285.4 kilojoules. I can't imagine a teacher uh, giving you a thermochemistry test without testing you on the potential energy diagrams. So make sure you know exothermic goes downward, 
endothermic goes upward. Cool? Cool. We also want to be able to work with unit conversions. If NO2 has an enthalpy of formation of 33 kilojoules per mole, how do you convert that to kilojoules per gram? Well, 33, that's positive 33 kilojoules per mole needs to be multiplied by something to give us something in kilojoules per gram. The kilojoules is already on the top of that unit, but moles it was on bottom and we need to replace it with grams. So we want to replace or we want to multiply this by moles per gram in order to make the units cancel out. You can also think of this as dividing by molar mass. There's no secret there. NO2 weighs 14 plus two sixteens. The molar mass is 46. And it is one mole of NO2 per 46 grams of NO2. So the number of kilojoules per gram is 33 times one over 46, which gives me 0 0.717 kilojoules per gram. The sign is the same in both cases. Let me simplify that for you. If you want to convert from kilojoules per mole to kilojoules per gram, you can just divide by the molar mass. If you want to convert from kilojoules per gram to kilojoules per mole, you'll times it by the molar mass. I like showing this unit analysis method because it always convinces me that I have the right units in the end. Kilojoules per mole times moles per gram gives me kilojoules per gram because the moles canceled. How about that? What is it in joules per molecule? Well, that's more of a stoichiometry question. What we're saying here is that there are 33 kilojoules per re released, oh no, 33 kilojoules required to form one mole of the molecule. 33 kilojoules is 33,000 joules and one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Do you remember that conversion? If you don't, your teacher might ask you and then you would be smoked. 33,000 joules divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules means that we are requiring 5.48 times 10 to the negative 20 joules for every single molecule of NO2 that is formed. How many molecules can be formed with one joule of energy? Well, if each one molecule requires this much energy, I just need to break my full one joule up into tiny packets, each worth 5.48 times 10 to the negative 20 joules per molecule. You can probably see the units are gonna work out here, but again, one molecule needs this much energy, so I break my one joule or divide it up into packets that are this small. One joule divided by that answer gives me 1.82 times 10 to the power of 19 molecules, which probably seems like a lot of molecules for a single measly joule of energy, but that's not even close to a full mole. A full mole is 10 to the 23. Cool? Cool. The last section I have for you is about delta S and delta G. Some teachers do it in grade 12, some teachers do not. Let's talk about entropy first. Delta S, I like to think of as a change in the disorder of a system. If something becomes more disordered, more disordered, then you have a positive delta S because the change is becoming more disordered and a system that is becoming less disordered, which double negative cancels out to more ordered. I do that in my head. I actually think less disordered in my own head. Delta S is negative in those cases. This question is asking, is delta S positive or negative? So the real question is, is it becoming more or less disordered? 
In question A, we have two molecules of gas on the left and three total molecules of gas on the right. In addition, it is a pure substance on the left and a mixture on the right. Which of those seems more chaotic and disordered to you? Hopefully it's the mixture that has more molecules in it because more molecules floating around your container means more chances for chaos. More disorder means delta S is positive in this case. Converting from a gas to a liquid is converting from molecules that are freely moving all around the container into a little puddle of water, a pile of liquid water. That pile of liquid water is not moving all around the container. It is becoming less disordered, and so delta S is negative in that case. Here we have two uh, moles of gas on the left and two moles of gas on the right. So the number of moles of gas is not changing. That might imply to you that there is the same amount of disorder on both sides, but I want to point out that there is a mixture on the left and a pure substance on the right. So it is more chaotic here simply because you have a mixture of two things. And this is only HI molecules moving around. We have less disorder. It is more ordered. And so delta S is negative here as well. When you heat liquids or when you heat anything, actually, you are adding energy to the system. Whether it's a solid melting into a liquid or a liquid heating up or a gas heating up or a liquid becoming a gas, adding energy to something makes them move around faster and thus you are causing more disorder because there's more motion and more chances for the molecules to hit each other or hit the wall or do a whole bunch of other stuff. Higher temperatures generally mean more disorder. Just like gas to liquid kind of implied a lower temperature, which was less disorder. In this case, we have two aqueous components crystallizing into a solid, the aqueous components can move all around the beaker that contains them. And the solid is a crystal that sits at the bottom of it as a precipitate. We're becoming less disordered because, well, first of all, this is a mixture and this is a pure substance, but also two things become one and aqueous things have more freedom than solid things. Gas is always higher in entropy than liquids and liquids are always higher in entropy than solids. Aqueous, I can't say for sure where they are. I like to put them generally in between liquids and gases. But the part the, here that actually matters is that gases are always more disordered than liquids and liquids are always more disordered than solids simply because of the nature of the energies that each of these types of substances have. Cool? Cool. Okay, if we assume that delta H and delta S do not change with temperature, at what temperature does this reaction become spontaneous? What you might, we need to know is that delta G is negative when a reaction is spontaneous and delta G is positive when it's not spontaneous, also known as spontaneous in the reverse direction. Delta G is zero at that threshold because zero is the threshold between positive and negative. So, when, if we're asked when it becomes spontaneous, we want to set delta G less than zero because delta G being less than zero is what makes it spontaneous. So delta G being delta H minus T delta S, delta H minus T delta S, we are going to set that less than zero. The delta H is given to us. It is 131.3 kilojoules. We're going to be solving for a temperature T and we are given the entropy delta S. Now, delta H was in kilojoules, so I'm gonna make sure this is in kilojoules by dividing by a thousand. That's 0 0.1336. And that's now in kilojoules per Kelvin. And we're setting this less than zero. Now, how do you solve an inequality like this one? Well, the answer, the easiest answer is to take 
what is subtracted from the left and move it to the right the same way you would if this was an equal sign. The only way you treat a less than sign differently from an equal sign is if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative. So we have 131.3. I'm going to ignore the units because I now know they're both in kilojoules less than 0.1336t. And then I can divide both sides by that number in order to isolate for t. 131.3 divided by 0.1336 gives me 982.8 less than t. So I can rewrite that with everything flipped, t on the left, this is a greater than sign, 982.8. This is in Kelvin, and what this is telling us is that the, at temperatures greater than 982.8 Kelvin, this reaction is spontaneous. 983, 984, 1000, a million, all of those temperatures make this reaction spontaneous. Anything less than this in Kelvin will make the reaction spontaneous in the reverse direction. Cool? Cool. The last question I have for you is that mercury freezes at this temperature and its enthalpy of fusion, that's melting, is positive 2.33 kilojoules per mole. What is delta S for this freezing of one mole of Hg? So, at the freezing point is when melting or actual freezing becomes spontaneous, so delta G is zero. Delta G is always delta H minus T delta S. And delta G by definition at the freezing point for freezing is zero. Now, delta H was given to us. It was 2.33 kilojoules per mole. We are given the temperature, three, negative 38.9, Celsius converted to Kelvin is add 273.15. That's negative 38.9 plus 273.15, which gives me 234.25, 234.25 Kelvin. Uh, you know what, I'll keep the kilojoules here. And the delta S is what we're solving for. All right, I'm gonna move this stuff to the other side just like I did in the other thing. I've got 234.25 Kelvin times delta S equals 2.33 kilojoules. And I'll divide both sides by this number, 234.25, in order to solve for delta S. 2.33 divided by that number gives me 9.95 times 10 to the minus three, 9.95 kilojoules per Kelvin. It's technically kilojoules per mole Kelvin because I was given a single mole here. And I'm gonna convert this to joules by multiplying by a thousand. It's 9.95 joules per Kelvin. That is the standard unit for entropy. And we calculated it here by being given all the other information we needed, including delta G, delta H, and T. Cool, well that's the end of this mega video. Good on you for finishing it with me, best of luck.